Feliz de las, de, las, de las Muertes. That one very good. Can you translate that for us? <laughs> Feliz Dia de los Muertos. Happy Death Day in Mexico. Uh, yes, today is Day of the Dead in Mexico. And uh, as Jesus was telling me before the show, everybody's already getting into Christmas. We will actually have some Christmas jazz uh, as an intro next week. Um, I'm going to miss the the music that we just played. It helps me get going right before a show. Today, we're going to be talking about artificial intelligence, AI. You know, everybody's applying AI to everything. And there's good reason for it. Uh, I'm working with an AI company, have been for several years. The company's called K-Health. It was in um, the Forbes AI 50, gosh, two or three years ago, where, you know, companies all over the world were saying, we're doing AI, we're doing AI, we're doing AI. Those companies were... Um, there was a big survey by uh, Forbes magazine, business magazine. They looked at companies. There were two in healthcare that were actually doing it. One of them was K-Health. If you're interested in that, let us know. I did a series of videos on that. Uh, I got some really interesting uh, insight into how AI works and how it works for, um, for that part of medicine. Now, you, that part of medicine, though, is different from what we do. That K-Health is like a digital urgent care clinic, similar to MD Live um, and some other uh, digital urgent care groups. We're talking about AI for a totally different application today. The application that we're talking about is for reading angiograms. You know... <clears throat> I've criticized angiograms a lot, and it's for good reason. Uh, an angiogram is based on the assumption, the plumbing assumption, the plumbing model. In other words, it says, well, it makes sense, makes a lot of sense that um, you want to be able to get flow through that artery. But that's not exactly, uh, that leads to the wrong uh, perception. People therefore think if you've got a little bit of plaque, it's okay if it's not disturbing the flow. And if you've got a lot of plaque, that's a real problem. It's not how much plaque you have. It's not how much it impacts the flow. What the real problem is, the real danger is, is whether or not that plaque is soft. So we're going to go through a good new article. There's a lot of uh, focus on artificial intelligence and doing a thing called uh, uh, free flow reserve. Uh, so we'll talk about that in a little bit later when we get to the major con content for the day. We've got several other, um, other things to cover. For those of you who have not seen this channel before, we do the information that you miss from your doctor, uh, the information that unfortunately is the most important if you'd like to live a long life, a long, healthy life. Um, we talk about things that people are interested in as well, like supplements. People tend to think that, you know what, I can do this without, lifestyle's hard, I don't like medications, let me just do it with a supplement. Uh, we covered that concept and a new antioxidant that's been out recently with a lot of good information, but you got to look under the hood. Uh, that was last week's topic on, is this new antioxidant safe? Obesity is a huge problem. Uh, if I could change one thing about the, my patient population and the rest of the public in the United States and now other countries, it would be if they could lose weight because that weight loss is more associated with um, cardiovascular health than anything else. Aging is a bigger driver of cardiovascular disease, but you can't do anything about aging. We can do something about obesity. Then the third top sample topic that we've covered recently is the, the quote verdict on vitamin D. The New England Journal had a great article on it, but I think they missed the boat. So if you have an interest, take a look. Um, back to what we do, what our, our purpose, our mission is. 
Um, it's been demonstrated very clearly from my old cohort at Hopkins, from uh, Mayo Clinic, from several other basic sci medical science research centers that your typical doctor prim taking primary care uh, patients and seeing those of you on the channel and everybody else doesn't know how to diagnose the most common and biggest root cause driver of death and disability, prediabetes and diabetes. If they don't know how to diagnose it, how do they know how to manage it? So unfortunately, it's a buyer beware space. You can learn, believe it or not, it sounds intimidating. How can I learn more than a doctor who's been through years and years of training and experience? You don't have to learn everything that the doctors learned in medical school. You just have to learn the parts that they didn't that are critical to your health. We've got um, courses, a couple of hours each, insulin resistance, cardiovascular inflammation, and how to assess plaque. Critical pieces in terms of uh, managing your health. Plaque assessment, for example, don't be like Tim Russert and say, hey, doc, I've got a, I'm a little bit worried. Can we, uh, about maybe having a heart attack, can we just do a stress test? Because he did, his doc agreed, and he passed the stress test with flying colors and then died from a sudden heart attack uh, a few weeks later. Stress tests are not the way to go. But guess what? Uh, the, the, the science proved that a few, what, decades ago. And since then, uh, you would think that stress tests would decrease. What have they done, Jesus? No, uh, I think they have already increased on massive numbers. The, the science was clear. 90% of, of stress tests are done to evaluate uh, patients for, uh, for heart attack. 90% of stents are placed to prevent heart attack. Neither one of them works for that. And yet you would think that therefore we would learn and therefore stop doing it. We've gone the other direction. We're doing more and more. The standards committee, even the standards committees, I, I have plenty of arguments with different standards committees, but uh, the standards committees, uh, the board of internal medicine, um, um, family medicine, <clears throat> uh, diabetes association, they all say stress tests are way, way overused. Why? They help pay mortgages and a few other reasons. And, 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 it, and it's also something that seems very, very logical and therefore nobody questions it. It's time to question it. And if I can tell, I can tell you, I can, I'm sorry, Doc, I, I just want to add something really quick. And, and that goes to the, the medical training that you just mentioned. I, 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 it just came to my mind, my months of cardiology training during prevention and occupational medicine, and they had a space specifically for stress test and eco cardio, cardio stress test as well with uh, ultrasound and everything. But they don't talk about any of this that we're talking about right now. So that's that's the reality. How much did they cover um, OGTT or glucose tolerance tests? Never. I, I, I was a couple of months on cardiology and endocrinology uh, consultations, and I, I didn't see that happening once. Buyer beware. Very interesting. So how about um, our content? If if folks are, are interested in our content, but you're not a YouTuber, um, you can go to Locals, you can go to Rumble if you're interested in that platform. If you're a YouTuber, you can help us get this information out by joining the YouTube channel. We would appreciate it. We thought the subscription plans might go uh, the way of the dinosaur once we got geared up with uh, Medicare, but no, nope, not so not so fast. They may end up actually becoming even more important, especially for groups that have commercial insurance as opposed to Medicare. I'm going to skip over the prevention book um, unless you have any comments about it today. No, I'm, I'm just thinking out loud right now. What if we work on translating this book on Spanish? I mean... That's, That's a good point. That, yeah. 
probably that's something we need to look forward as well during this process of translating content to the folks who speak only Spanish. As you might have guessed, Jesus is a, a native Spanish speaker. Um, he and I have been talking about uh, providing this kind of information to Spanish populations. Jesus has been looking around and there's a lot of Spanish speaking people, uh, but there's not a lot of uh, content. Uh, there's a lot of a significant amount of Spanish content uh, for medicine, but it's all in those standards of medicine, which ignores OGTT and cardiovascular inflammation and the things that we cover. So <clears throat> a tip for, uh, for different statins, those of you who are up for using statins, and if you have plaque, I would ex I would suggest, I do suggest that you consider a statin. I wouldn't go with Lipitor, period. But uh, there are a couple of statins that are appropriate. Neither one of them uh, is necessary in high doses, with rare exceptions. Um, Zipitamag, uh, there are two types, Levalo or Patavastatin and uh, Crestor or Resuvastatin. Um, all of the Levalov or Patavastatin is low dose. It's the kinder, gentler um, statin, but it's expensive. It's made in, in uh, Japan. The Japanese the, uh, company that makes it knows that it's got a great, uh, great advantage. It's the only one that doesn't uh, push you down that diabetes highway. Um, so they, they still have their patent and they're still charging a huge amount. A lot of insurance companies will still put you and your doctor through a lot of grief in order to get that medication. So there's one way to access it uh, more simply and far less expensively. It's Zipitamag. And you can actually get that from a couple of uh, pharmacies here in the U.S. Marley Drug is one of them. We can help if you have an interest in accessing it that way. Um, <clears throat> I mentioned uh, resuvastatin. Resuvastatin is, uh, does push you down that diabetes highway, but not at the lower doses, five milligrams per day or less. It's rare for my patients to have significant problems on statins because I don't use 10, 20, 30, I mean, uh, 10, 20, 40 uh, milligrams of resuvastatin and 20 and 40 and 80 milligrams of uh, atorvastatin or Lipitor. I just don't use them. They're not necessary. Uh, Simvastatin and Prevastatin are older. Uh, they were good. We did use them a lot when, um, when um, Resuvastatin was still under patent. But when that patent broke, it really uh, broke the need to go to try others like Prevastatin and Simvastatin. Now, a little update on what we're doing. So we've been having nightmares with the Medicare Enrollment Credentialing Engagement Programs. And it's, uh, oh gosh, how do you spell pain? Dolor. Uh, Mucho dolor. <laughs> Mucho dolor. Uh, Jesus has been with us when we're, when we're, uh, uh, we've been going through this pain. So there's two two branches to what we do and we'll be doing in prevention on the Medicare side. The first one is seeing patients directly ourselves. The second one is what we call an MSO, Managed Services Organization. And what we do with the MSO is we actually can take doctors like your doctor and help them do prevention, help them do population-based medicine, help them understand how to do what we do. And guess what else? They get paid more for it. They get paid a lot more uh, than Medicare pays them currently for their, they're on a fee for service treadmill. So <clears throat> when we started having so much problems with the enrollment engagement credentialing uh, bureaucrats in Medicare, um, we, we pivoted and we said, okay, we're gonna help set up the doctor's network. Let me explain for a minute why we were having trouble. So uh, the, the challenge is working with, again, working with bureaucrats. So in the past, prior to the um, epidemic, the pandemic, 
Medicare said, look, you can't practice uh, telemedicine unless unless we, we just don't pay for telemedicine visits. Well, you know, obviously that's what I do. That's what I've done for many companies, MD Live, K Health, Premise, other companies, and now now us. And I've always felt like we needed to provide improved access to care, and especially for chronic diseases. Chronic disease is a lifestyle issue. It is an education uh, type of medicine. Labs and education. We look at your, uh, your metabolism using labs, and then we have education. We, um, we don't do surgery, so we, don't, we can get a lot more access to a lot more people using, uh, using telemedicine. Well, be careful what you ask for. We had the pandemic, and sure enough, Medicare opened up. People got used to providing and getting their care from doctors remotely. But then that created a huge argument and debate and bureaucratic nightmare within Medicare. So now the pandemic is effectively over. Now they're saying, okay, uh, maybe we're gonna continue this. Maybe we're not. Maybe we do extend it for 150 days. Jesus, you have any idea where we are now on that? Well, uh, I can tell you right now for the folks that we have from Florida, we are almost on 30 patients now. So, and for all, all over the country, we have a few hundreds waiting for us. So, and again, this is what they're waiting for. They're waiting on Medicare to get their act together to decide, okay, uh, is we is or is we ain't? You know, are, are, what are we doing in terms of telemedicine? So back to the to what we do. Your typical uh, program uh, in a Medicare Advantage environment, med standard Medicare environment, chronic disease environment in the prevention space has both provider services and uh, MSO services. So as the, we're continuing to get some of the headache on the provider services, we're going back into the MSO and network services. This is a brochure that we developed for the doctor and basically, it's showing that your doctor is on a treadmill doing fee-for-service. It's not helping the patient. That's why Medicare is paying less and less for it. Um, what we will start doing is providing them information where they can to help them start doing what we do. So if you have a doc, you like the doc, start providing them, them this information. Over the next week or so, you should see us start setting up a website for your doctor's again, to help them form a network with us and get into fee-for-value or population-based medicine or prevention. We'll keep you posted on this. This is our staff. Um, as you see, Dr. Uh, Raj Patel, who's done this for decades. Uh, I worked with him for a few years at a company called uh, Physician Partners. We did a lot of... Um, a lot of work, basically training docs for over 100, 150,000 covered lives. Um, <clears throat> we will keep you, as you, you'll also see, uh, Jesus is on there. He runs our CCM program. You want to describe that CCM program again real quick? Sure, sure. absolutely. So CCM is Chronic Care Management Program by Medicare. And basically, it's a program that is focused on fee for value. And the idea is to get a close monitoring status from patients. So the structure needs for us to get a first approach that can be an annual wellness visit with a patient. And then we have some uh, periodic visits with a provider. But we are also using a platform called CCIQ, which help us track how the progress is on the side of the patient how is their blood glucose, blood pressure, weight uh, is going, and if there is anything that needs uh, to be addressed before a consultation. So the, the idea is to uh, reduce the gap between visit and visit with the physician. So we are always aware of what's going on. Very good. So now to another topic. We're covering food. I'm, I'm being more transparent with my food. Have you ever had uh, chicharrones, Jesus? Sure. Th those are the, your typical Sunday snack in Mexico. So, why Sunday? 
uh, on Sunday, at least on there's there's a region in Mexico called the Bajio, which is kind of uh, center and a little bit to the north. Not not so far north, but just a little north to Mexico City. And we usually eat barbacoa or carnitas, which is uh, pork meat and uh, beef meat, but it's cooked in a different way. And part of that goes with the chicharrones of pork, pork ribs. So is that barbecue like uh, U.S. barbecue? Mm, no, because U.S. barbecue is more like uh, sweet. And here's the meat. It's basically the meat. You use some uh, spicy salsa uh, and lemon, a lot of lemon. And the uh, downside probably is tortillas because it's too much carbs on tortillas. But well, yeah, tacos, right. Mexico tacos, that's the idea. But yeah. The tortillas are your downfall in Mexico. Yeah. yeah. I, I always Big say issue. that to my patients. You can eat tacos, of course. but And they are worried about the, the pork meat. But I'll tell them it's not the pork meat, it's the tortillas. <laughs> yeah, exactly right. So anyhow, I've gotten into these microwaved heated pork rinds. They are great for breakfast. If you want a hot breakfast, but you want uh, you don't want any carbs and you want something with crunch, try it. Uh, and I obviously don't get any um financial stuff back from Lowry's or any other pork rind provider. Okay, so let's get into the science part of uh, uh, of what we're talking about today. This is, a again, a, a prelude slide. This is not the major topic. And it gets into a big issue. No pain, no gain. I grew up in uh, Southern Baptist um, uh, Protestant work ethic culture. Very. My mom was a uh, grew up on the farm. Uh, ten girls, one boy. So the older girls, and she was one of them. Ended up, their dad called them. My grandfather called the older girls the field hands because they w did work in the fields all day every day. And um, she had some issues for me in terms of uh, my work ethic as well. And uh, even when my wife is in her most critical moments, she said, Ford, both of our kids work extremely hard. And that's very healthy. That's very, uh, very good for them. And we both know where they got that from. So, yep, I, uh, <clears throat> I've been called a workaholic. I, I just enjoy what I do. This is, uh, there's nothing like saving lives. You know, you could play golf, you could travel, but why not save lives? So there's a no pain, no gain issue um, that is related to this. You've, you've heard that before. Um, and it's true. This was uh, applied to people that have plaque in their lower extremities, PAD, peripheral arterial um, plaque. You want to tell us a little bit about what you found there, Jesus? Sure. Uh, so the idea behind this study was that uh, people who have plaque on their legs, the main issue is pain because when the plaque is big enough can cause a decreased blood flow and that itself can cause pain. So uh, what the others wanted to compare was what happens if you try to move that part of the leg, if you try to move and uh, stimulate that part of the body and compare that with folks who can who walk, but the intensity of the walking is not enough to induce pain, and those folks who didn't walk. So what they found out, even though it was only 300 participants, what they found out is the people who uh, walk in a intensity that was enough to cause some pain, even though there was pain involved, they achieved better results by walking. So they were able to increase the strength of the lower extremities and walk even longer distances. Now, there was a weird twist to this, though. What happened at the 12-month period? Yeah, the effect got lost. Yes. Wonder why. <laughs> so, well, you know, to me, I think there's a, a couple of... The, 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 the effect just sort of petered out at 12 months. And... So I think um, I think it does make the point. I think there is truth to the no pain, no gain. But um, there's an even deeper underlying point, and that is 
come on, listen to us. Don't get in that kind of space anyway. Don't uh, don't carb it up. Don't don't have a BMI of 28. Or if you are in that space, start listening to the content, listen to the channel, come see us, get set up and um, and don't get that plaque in your legs. It's, you know, there are ways to, to do it better, but ways to do it worse. But the best way by far is to prevent it from the beginning. Anything else on that? No, 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 not at all. Okay, so uh, if you'll give us the water ball, Aspen, we'll talk about AI and detection of plaque. So everybody's gaga about AI. And so, and for good reason, it's doing a lot of really good stuff. But is it great? Is it the best thing for plaque detection? Well, why don't you get us started, Jesus? Well, uh, this is an article that came from the Journal of American College of Cardiologists this year. It's a multi-center study, and they were trying to compare what type of um, test was better to evaluate uh, occlusion of the coronary arteries on the heart. They use the word stenosis, basically the same thing. And they compared these four types of uh, measurements. When you look at those, uh, CT, we have talked about CT angiogram in the past, but the difference between a CT angiogram and an AI CT angiogram is that the interpretation is not done by a physician, but rather a machine. So that's basically the difference. If you compare what a CT angiogram says and the interpretation from a physician, physician versus the computer or the artificial intelligence software they have using here, they, they're using something from a company called Clearly, Clearly Labs. And they have been working on that for a couple of years from now. And that's what they are studying in this, in, in this article. They used other other types of analysis like core lab quantitative quantitative coronary angiography, which is basically uh, another type of interpretation by the software it's itself, not an AI software, and invasive fractional flow reserve, which is uh, based on the flow assumption as well. So, the their their hypothesis was that there's evidence that suggests that inexpert, inexpert clinical readings of CT angiograms might result in great overestimation of the artery occlusion. So they say that people who are doesn't have enough training or expertise on reading CT angiograms might see plaque where there is not plaque. So that's, that's why they did, did this. So let me go back and frame this up a little bit. Um, it, as we've talked, there's a obviously a big focus on trying to predict heart attack and stroke. Uh, there's the assumption that if you can tell just how much plaque somebody has in the arteries of their heart, you may be able to predict that. We've talked about that. Let's put the, our, our position aside for a few minutes and talk about a little bit more about what's going on in this space. Um, even the standards of medicine, the standard bodies realize um, uh, stress test is overused, cath lab is overused. Now, <clears throat> what we would say is there are really a couple of different types of things that really help. We don't recommend you, do, you start with a stress test. We don't recommend you start with a cath lab angiogram, which is what the vast majority of doctors, internists, cardiologists will take you to do. We recommend a couple of other things. Um, like Ivor Cummins, we recommend calcium score. Unlike uh, Ivor Cummins, though, we would say there's a major problem with calcium score, and that is calcium actually shows that the plaque is stable. What you don't get on calcium score is how much unstable or soft plaque there is. So you can get that through a thing called CIMT, which we recommend. So we re so far we re we've been recommending two things, calcium score and CIMT. There is a third thing that both groups, we've, uh, we've said there's a lot of promise to this. 
And the guys that do stress tests and, and cath labs, they're saying the same thing. CT angiogram. And how does that work? You basically just put dye into a vein out in the arm. Then after you inject that radioactive dye, you start taking pictures of the coronary arteries. That's called a CT angiogram. Now, what Jesus pointed out is uh, most of these are read by inexpert people, you know, basically just a cardiologist that doesn't do a whole bunch of these or a radiologist that doesn't do a whole bunch of these. And what they're finding is it's real easy to see those things and say, and pull the panic button, as we used to say at Toyota, pull the and on, stop the presses, do alarms, and you know what that means. You're gonna be taking the patient right in for a stent, which again, we've talked about. 90% of stents, stents don't prevent heart attacks. So that's gonna be one of those stents that didn't help the patient. So what they're saying is, we, this group, this group of researchers from U.S., Portugal, South Korea, China, Japan, Italy, the Netherlands, all recognize this problem. And they said, maybe we can apply AI to it. And they're looking at things like fractional flow reserve. Jesus, do you want to explain what that is? Yeah, it's basically, if we go to the, to the next slide, there's a, a small image at the bottom that can help us understand that. So it's basically a standard technique for to assess the lesion specific, and they are like indirectly measuring the size of the plaque by saying how much flow we get before the plaque and how much of that gets to go after that plaque. And th this is a standard measurement that they use to find out if the plaque is um, uh, occluding the artery on a 50% or to 90%. So, so but this, this is basically the size of the plaque. Not, they don't say more than that. So what they're doing, again, it's looking at plumbing. And what they're saying is, okay, let's look at the plaque. Let's measure the pressure before you, you get into the plaque and the pressure of the flow afterwards or the flow before and the flow afterwards. And therefore, if there's a big difference, we know that plaque is impeding flow. So um, this one says invasive fractional flow reserve. What's the, what does that mean? Well, uh, the difference between that angiogram to an angiography is that instead of getting uh, your contrast during, through a vein on your arms, you're getting that uh, through an artery on your growing, the femoral artery, which usually and you get a catheter going up uh, to measure that the, the, on a more direct way. Yeah. So in invasive, they're talking about they're doing it in the cath lab with the catheter that's been inserted into your groin, threaded up to your heart and threaded back into these arteries. Whereas with CT angiogram, they're talking about the injection is out in the arm and they're looking to use AI to try to get a better estimate of that functional flow reserve. Any other and, comments on that? Yeah, they, they, they called, uh, and while researching for this, uh, part of this on the core lab quantitative coronary angiogram, like doing this in basic procedure, uh, they call this the gold standard to measure uh, plaque on coronary arteries and occlusion but that doesn't mean that it predicts heart attacks. Very, very good point. So they're saying, okay, well, if you do an invasive one, that's the gold standard. And we're trying to look at these CT angiograms to see how they compare, right? Yeah. But as we've said from day one, um, uh, the, What's the hero has feet of clay. The gold standard is not very golden because it doesn't predict heart attacks either. It does predict the cardiologist's ability to make a few bucks by inserting a stent, but that's a different issue. That's not the patient's health. So it's a retrospective study. The, the researchers used CT angiogram, functional flow reserve and QCA data from uh, which was the, um, 
gold standard, I think you mentioned a minute ago, from yep. 330 stable patients, age 64, plus or minus 10 years from the Credence trial. That was another trial that was looking at something else. They used cloud-based software that performed AI-enabled coronary segmentation, vessel wall determination, plaque quantification, characterization, and occlusion. So every kind of plumbing component that you can look at. The results were 32% of patients had greater than 50% occlusion. The average AI QCT analysis time was 10.3 minutes. There was a high correlation between, between occlusion detected by AI QCT versus the QCA. The, in other words, the um, CT angiogram with the peripheral, the IV in the arm uh, versus uh, using AI versus the, um, the, the cath lab angiogram going up through the groin. False positive AIQCTs were noted in 7.3 vessels. So um, still at the end of the day, well, it looks, it looks better than, it looks like another improvement. And people will be sending questions in saying, hey, my doc has, says there's this new type of study. It's CT, CTA, FFR, uh, AI, so that means CT angiogram where you inject it in the, in the arm. FFR, that functional flow reserve that we described where you're figuring out how much of a decrease in the flow there has been. And then AI using artificial intelligence. That's going to be the next, uh, the next big development. The results were it improved the specificity. 91% versus 80% and accuracy, 91% versus uh, 84% in women. There are no differences seen for people with BM, different BMIs and other risk factors such as diabetes, hypertension, dyslipidemia, or tobacco, which again makes all kinds of sense because these, this is all plumbing. There was increased sensitivity for plaque burden and calcified plaque burden, but decrease in spe specificity and accuracy. So... Uh, point of view, Jesus? Um, yeah. So one thing that that can be said also about this uh, this study is they were uh Oh, comparing... I think we're having a... I think you froze up on us. I'll take over for a second. Oh, there you go. Go ahead. Try it again. I'm, so, I'm sorry about that. So uh, the the perspective here, they were, they were saying... Uh, the computer-based interpretation, it's really a like, like the AI interpretation. And the AI, artificial intelligence is a little bit better on telling us what we're looking for here. Not so much as the opinion of the expert who is reading this. And they say that based on that, you should get this software to interpret the CT angiograms and CT angiographies. But the thing is that they are looking at the, they're not looking at the root cause of this and they are not seeing differences between diabetes, people with diabetes, hypertension and obesity. They just say, hey, we found plaque that is over 50% occluding the artery. So you may have a heart attack, probably you should get a stent. And there's no more information about soft and, uh, versus hard plaque. Uh, they had a supplement document where they say, you can look at the difference over here, but it didn't say too much about when that plaque was soft and there was no more detail on those plaques that were occluding below 50% that we know can kill two thirds of patients. Really good point. So here's what the, all this means. Yes, if you're getting a CT angiogram and you're looking at functional flow reserve, you're gonna get better results from using AI. However, go back and think about what you're looking at. You're looking at plumbing. Uh, and you're not looking at soft versus hard plaque. This is not a plumbing issue. It's a metabolic issue. Therefore, soft plaque is the key risk factor. If you're not getting that, we don't recommend it yet. So uh, we, do, uh, we, are, we do have a, a lot of people that have done a CT angiogram with us. There are, way, there are some advantages to it. As we said, it's not completely ready for prime time yet. So there we go. I think that finishes us out for the content for today or the planned content. And now we've got, if you'll give us the uh, transition, we'll go into Q&A.
So let me take a look. <clears throat> oh gosh, we got a lot of questions today. ET himself, good morning. Uh, JMK2921, given the fact that I already have a heart attack and a stent placement three years ago, will Medicare pay for a coronary CT angiogram every one to two years to monitor my coronary plaque status? Uh, I am the, I, I don't know. I'm, I'm not going to answer uh, for Medicare on wh what they will pay for. Uh, this is a developing area and it's going to be a developing area for them in terms of of uh, what they pay for. Sorry, I can't give you better information, but I can't. Desitivity, good morning from Georgia. Bambi Gray, Bambi, I did not, you know, I did not remember that you lived in California. So thank you for sharing that. Mabu, hi, Bobby. Long, healthy life, beautiful life. Rick Folia, good morning from Atlanta. I've, uh, I'm from Spartanburg, South Carolina, very close to Atlanta. And uh, most of the people in small towns near Atlanta call it Hotlanta. E.T. himself, we have liftoff. Dave, the retired cop. Good morning, Doc. After my recent CT that resulted in a calcium score of 427, it's clear I need to focus on lifestyle changes, blood pressure and insulin resistance. I'm 62. I'm behind in the game. Any comments, Do Dr. Vega? I will say his interpretation is right on the spot because if you look at that you will see you will think that 400 is moderate to high risk of having a heart attack and it only means that you might have some soft plaque that has calcified but there's soft plaque in there probably so uh focusing on lifestyle doing other changes that that's the way to go I agree. And he goes on to say, I told my GP, my personal treatment plan, to follow the uh, Micah 6 a love, mercy, act justly and walk humbly with my God. Looking forward to moving to your practice for Medicare. We're looking forward to getting it set up. Oh, you know what? Speaking of which, there's a glimmer of good news. Just over the past 24 hours, the uh, credentialing bureaucrats are now saying, hmm, Really, you only need to register from one state, your home state, which would be Kentucky, because I'm transmitting uh, or broadcasting here from Lexington today, my home. If that happens, we may get there much quicker than we thought. So keep us in your prayers. Bobby Ocampo, Feliz Navidad. Maligayang Pasco, I've never seen that part. Uh, Aspen, any interpretation for Maligayang Pasco? I would say it's Feliz Navidad as well. Uh, maybe. I, I'm, I'm impressed because uh, people from the Philippines and Mexican culture is really alike. Yes. So we kind of understand each other, even there's are two different languages. Yep. This is Dipolog, I think. Uh, but there's a lot of Spanish there. Paul rails back. AI is going to replace all the docs that just use guidelines. <laughs> It's true. AI is going to do a better job in terms of making decisions, but AI can't interact with patients. So you find that in all these AI, quote, replacement activities, they do replace things. They do some thinking and they do some algorithms, but they don't interact with people so well. And I, I have... I have a comment on there, and this is something that I see every day on my practice. I have a, I have a lots of patients that come because they got an electrocardiogram, uh, which is basically just measuring at one moment the electric uh, rhythm of your heart. And some physicians, usually general practice physicians or even uh, family physicians in Mexico, tend to not read directly the results, but base the, their interpretation on what the machine says. And the machine usually has some interpretation about and we, I have had children or adults that say, hey, this, this patient might have a heart attack right now. You better rush him into the ER. And the patient is like with no symptoms at all. And I get those patients. So I, I was like, well, I don't think machines are completely capable of, of uh, substituting a physician. Though. You are so right. AI, they're using AIs a, a lot for interpretation of EKG. And I think they cause more trouble than their help. For, at least for that part. They're just not good at that. Johnny F., can fish oil supplements help? 
some recent articles on too much can cause heart issues. I haven't seen re recent articles on too much fish oil causing problems. Have you, Jesus? Yes, uh, there is a comment on the journal uh, on JAMA, the American Medical Association, last year, I think, or this year. They took a look at four studies about how much fish oils can induce atrial fibrillation, but the results were suggestive, not conclusive. So I will say that there's still some stuff to look around. I don't remember how much those w was it. I will have to take a look back at it again to that. You know, now that you mention it, it does remind me. It starts to come back out of the fog. I was uh, eyeball deep in the Alabama project, and I remember seeing that, seeing the headline, but not really getting too deep. So just like a lot of these articles, an early signal, but not any conclusive proof yet. So I'm glad you were there. Glad you remembered. Um, Melissa says, I had an MI, myocardial infarction, heart attack. In July, I currently take lisinopril for blood pressure control. My cardiologist wants to add a beta blocker. He said beta blockers are good after MI. Your thoughts? How about your thoughts, Jesus? <laughs> I would say that's the standard. And, and I, I, will, I will confess, a few months ago, I thought the same. Uh, because beta blockers can reduce the amount of effort that the, the heart makes after a heart attack and reduce the blood flow that is required for the heart to 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 function, but they have a really bad bad side effect that is induced insulin resistance. So in the long term, I don't think those are the best option. So that's a you bring up a great point. So <clears throat> so many people come to us and they're on beta blockers for. I had two come to me yesterday on beta blockers, no stents, no MIs, no. Um, no heart failure, just for blood pressure. And that's old medicine. That's not good medicine. And as Jesus said, the reason it's been found to be not good medicine is that beta blockers like high dose statins push you down that um, diabetes highway. There are some that have been made like carvedilol, which are supposed to be better. But the bottom line is just avoid them at, if, if you can. Now, as Jesus also mentioned, it's not that simple. People that have had instrumentation to their heart, like a stent or um, bypass graft, people that have, um, uh, have had a recent MI, people that have, had, that have heart failure, all of these things tend to uh, put the patient at greater risk for um, dysrhythmias. And these things tend to decrease the probability of dysrhythmia. So yes, for, and, and here's the other, thing. so after a stent, uh, after bypass graft, yes, it makes sense. The, the data is pretty clear about that. And for people with uh, many versions of heart failure, yes, the data is pretty clear about that. But again, you're, you, your doctor needs to be aware of what they're doing and able to balance those competing issues. You know, the fact that some people, so many people come in and they're just on it for regular blood pressure is clear. It's, you know, it's the same thing that we see over and over and over again. The vast majority of primary care doctors do not know how to diagnose and deal with the major cause of heart attack and stroke, and that is insulin resistance. And that's what's on the guidelines. <laughs> uh, so, uh, that's, that, that's what's on the guidelines. And in Mexico, we have some guidelines that uh, physicians are tending to use because those are government based. So the government tells you, "Hey, this is the way you have you should treat each and each and each disease." You know, and it's it's basically su supposed to be based on evidence. And I, I I got this tattooed on my forehead when while I was studying that first option for hypertension diuretics, then you use haze inhibitors, and I think fourth option was beta beta blockers. So. That's, yeah. that, that's what the guidelines say. So, so what you're saying is there's another guideline you don't believe in. <laughs> not, not, not all of it. There's some good spots over there that can be useful, but not all of it. That's the thing. I agree. I mean, a whole lot of guidelines are really good. For example, the American College of Endocrinologists, the American Association of Clinical Endocrinologists have both said 
don't use hemoglobin A1C to diagnose diabetes because there's hemoglobin involved and anything that impacts hemoglobin can impact that study. But 99.99% of doctors out there ignore that and use hemoglobin A1C. That's one area where I'd say use the guidelines. They're correct. But then there are other places, as you've pointed out, Another place where I don't agree with the guidelines is the ADA, uh, American Diabetes Association, and AHA, American Heart Association, um, guidelines committees say don't use CIMT. I understand why they say that. There's a garbage in, garbage out thing regarding arterial age, but there's no garbage in, garbage out regarding the most important piece, and that is whether the plaque is soft uh, or stable. And that's very, very repeatable. That's very easily uh, done. And they've thrown the baby out with the bathwater. So there you go. So old Roscoe's making an economic comment. They're going to talk about the, uh, the Fed Reserve is going to talk about interest rates today. I heard beta blockers can cause an increased risk of diabetes. Is that true? Yes. We, that's what we just talked about. Why would I need a beta blocker after an MI? That's what we just talked about. So again, I think you put that information in before we talked about it. I hope that we got the coverage that, that you needed on that question. Bottom line is any kind of in instrumentation like a stent bypass or a heart attack all increase the risk for, um, for issues, especially um, dysrhythmias. Uh, dysrhythmias. And that's what the, that's needed for. Bobby Ocampo, all doctors here in the Philippines are well, are still concentrated on LDL cholesterol. Uh, the doctors in the Philippines are not at all unusual. It's Mexico, it's Europe. I've got patients in South America, the Middle East, obviously a ton of patients here in the U.S. All doctors are still focused on LDL. We, follow the, same, we follow the same evidence. Yeah. US we're, evidence. We study the same, the we use the same, the same resources. Right. It's, it's the same all over the world. E.T. himself, I had a bad bout of bowel obstruction last Thursday. Oh, that's bad to hear. What a way to start a fast. Keeping my total carbs below 35 per day was easy. Ouch. Well, mm, you know, one door closes, another one opens. Uh, maybe pardon the pun. Bobby Ocampo, we, we don't have CIMT. We have a carotid vertebral artery, artery duplex with plaque morphology type 1 to type 5. Yeah, there's a lot of different versions of ultrasound of the arteries in the neck here as well. But really, despite all of those things, they get too wrapped up in terms of measurements, too wrapped up in terms of trying to predict things from the measurements and the anatomy. All of that is, again, plumbing. What we really want to know is, do you have soft plaque? Bart Robinson. Good to hear from you, Bart. Six years ago, I had an NMR profile a few weeks after starting a statin, an aspirin, and a 500 calcium score. Should I get another NMR test? I'm 62 and extremely fit. Never any weight issues. I tell you what, by far the most important test to get on a follow-up basis is the um, OGTT with insulin response. What that does is tell you your, root, your status on your root cause. And each we recommend it each year because it helps you, even if you're full-blown diabetic and know it, because full-blown diabetes doesn't tell us whether your peak is 200 or your peak is 500. And those are two very, very diff different spaces in terms of level of disease. It's the same disease. So um, uh, first of all, People ignore OGTT, as we, we've discussed. The people that do OGTT will say, oh, wait a minute. Well, I know I have full-blown diabetes, so I don't want to do it again. Think about the logic here. So if you peak at 199, and therefore you don't make the cut point for full-blown diabetes, then you should do it every year. And then you get it to 201. Well, that's just a rounding error. Um, once you get to 201, you do want to know going from 199 to 201 is, is nothing. It's a rounding error. Going from 201 to 370, which we saw last week, is a big, big deal. So even if you've got diabetes, known diabetes, I'll recommend that on a, on a yearly basis. NMR, we do NMR for the vast majority of our patients. 
We don't actually do NMR. We do a different type of thing called fractionation. And people think that fractionation is telling them about their cholesterol because those are the measurements. It's really telling you about your carb metabolism. If you have questions about that, go back and view some of my old videos on triglyceride over HDL. So there are a couple of things that show up on fractionation and the standard cholesterol panel. Um, if your insulin values remain class, uh, routinely too high, insulin decreases your ability to burn body fat. So therefore, your triglyceride values will go up and up and up. So getting on a low-carb diet, you're going to see your triglycerides start to go back down. So that's one item. A, uh, the other item is if you're on, if you have a a diseased or broken carbohydrate metabolism, the normal, uh, the large fluffy LDL and HDL particles, which are healthy, are going to start replacing the cholesterol in the particle with fatty acids. When a, when a fatty acid laden particle goes through the liver, the liver metabolizes it. So you lose your large fluffy HDL as well as your large fluffy LDL. That's why you tend to start getting the small dense LDL. These are not, these are not actors so much as they are biomarkers of what's going on with your carb metabolism. That's why we get fractionation. And NMR is just another version of fractionation. Other comments, Jesus? Yeah, I saw recently an article where they did NMRs and compared small dense LDL radio versus Boyan LDL. And that radio was related to issues uh, metabolizing glucose. But I, I thought, well, it's good to have that, but that's information that you get from an OGTT. So, I mean, it, it's, uh, I, I will say that it's important to have all of these profiles, of course, but I will go back to Dr. Brewer's initial comment. The first one is OGTT and insulin resistance, insulin survey. I couldn't agree more. Everybody goes down all these bunny holes. Hey doc, what about a free, uh, uh, an AI driven uh, CTFFR? My doc tells me that's the greatest thing ever. And, and, and people are getting that and they're not getting OGTT. It's like uh, missing the forest for the trees. So um, Bobby Ocampa, the cheapest OGTT with insulin ass assay, I'm sure in the Filipino, that's, look, what is Filipino? Is that pesos? No. I'm not sure. Uh, 5,000, approximately 100 US dollars. Um, What's the I money? Yes, Ben. What's about to tell us? Yeah, Aspen? Espresso. 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 Okay, yes, I that's uh, more of that um, shared uh, his Hispanic culture between the Philippines and Mexico. Bart Robinson is patavastatin the American generic version of Lavallo. My prescription plan doesn't cover Lavallo. I'm confused. Yes, it is. So patavastatin is Lavallo. Now, uh, so just like rosuvastatin is Crestor. And as I had mentioned before, in one of the prelim articles for today, you, there are groups like uh, Marley Drug that do one type of generic. Here we are with that shaky paper again. Um, <laughs> going back to the basics. <laughs> uh, yeah, I see you laughing. Go, go, going back in time. <laughs> <laughs> hey, it's easy for you to laugh at me when I was struggling, you know. It, no, the, no, no, no. The problem was I didn't know how to do do a uh, PowerPoint, but that's a different story for a different time. The point, Bart, though, is that, yes, there are actually, they say there are, are no generics for uh, patavastatin, but that's not true. I have taken um, Pavasta, which is a generic made in India. And if you think, oh, I don't want to try an Indian made drug, all of the generics are made in India and some of the same places in the world. So I took Pavasta, made in India. I was fine with it. The one I just showed a second ago on this shaky paper is another type of generic. And I'm sure that within a couple of years, there'll be um, more generic versions for Lavallo or Patavastatin. 
If you want to get more information about how to get some of these Canadian uh, drug versions of it, like Pivasta, just give us a call. Uh, ask Ben if you'll show the number, 859-721-1414. That's 859-721-1414, and we can show you how to get generics for uh, pitavastatin. Bobby Ocampo, what do you call a test that measures LDL small particles and large buoyant particles? That's what we're talking about, NMR or fractionation. We prefer fractionation because it's just easier and simpler to read. But the labs are in the business to make things complicated and difficult. So <laughs> that's the way things go. Bart, Bobby, is that is the NMR profile. Yes, NMR or fractionation. And, you know, I like to mention other uh, YouTube uh, or uh, global entities out there. Um, oh, gosh, now... I, uh, what's the name of the um, Thomas Day Spring, the uh, lipidologist that uh, appears on a lot of other shows like Peter Atias. I agree. With, I'm a big Day Spring fan. I'm, I uh, learned a lot from his discussion of triglyceride and HDL ratios uh, with Peter Atia, but <clears throat> uh, I don't agree with everything he said. He's gotten back more into the lipid world recently. But uh, there's one comment that he's made that I <clears throat> agree 100%. Most doctors just look at the cholesterol panel <clears throat> and they miss it when they don't look at the fractionation. They just miss it. He would say completely. I'd say no. The triglyceride over HDL ratio is critical. And you get that from that, but you don't get the other stuff. So there you go. Thanks, Bart. I'm pretty sure anyway, yes, um, NMR and fractionation. Where do you practice in Mexico, Dr. Jesus? Well, I'm on a state called Querétaro. And I, I do have a telemedicine-based platform. The difference between the states and Mexico when to practice comes is that my license uh, allows me to practice in all over Mexico. I don't have to have a license for each state. So I, I just can go any, to any state and practice. It's not that difficult. But the thing is that, and I will take just a, one minute or two to talk about how public health works in Mexico, the difference to the states, if I can. Um, we don't have usually private insurance, just like in the U.S., uh, most of people in Mexico get medical service from the government, either if they're workers or have a public uh, social security service, or if they are teachers, army or whatever. Few, few people get our direct pay customers and or clients or patients. And just the really wealthy ones or uh, they are above the line have a private insurance. So what I'm going with all of this is that it's difficult for a Mexican to go over and get these types of tests or medications by themselves because they get what the government says. And the government says what their standards and what they have available for them. So they are switching medications usually, or they don't get the best medication or get something that they that is not just for them because there is not an other option. So we're doing our best to help folks over here but the economics and public health is just way different to the U.S. It's a nightmare. And in fact, it brings up a one of the questions that I uh, expect to hear in terms of our activities. Are you one of the doctors that, uh, that people can see with us? Uh, come again. I don't think I got that. <laughs> so if somebody says, Dr. Jesus, can I see you as my doctor here in the U.S.? No, unfortunately, unfortunately, I can't because I, I have I, I'm not licensed to practice in the in the U.S. I have a clinical role, a staff clinical staff role, uh, and I can discuss stuff with Dr. Brewer, but I'm not uh, legally able to provide medical advice to the U.S. folks. If you look at prevention programs, again, it's <clears throat> it's part of the public health and prevention programs that uh, Jesus was just talking about. Uh, if you look at those programs here in the U.S., there's a lot of foreign trained medical doctors playing roles in terms of administration. If you look at the quality of uh, the medicine that's provided by those folks, by the way, 
believe it or not, when you look at hardcore, very, very clear um, quality work, the foreign train docks often do better. Now, why is that? Um, I did a I did a video on it. Uh, it's way back in the in the catacombs of the channel. But I've done uh, medical quality. I've supervised thousands of docs and have done medical quality programs uh, for decades. That's what I've been ever since I left Hopkins and even before I left there. One of the things that you find is the guys like me that went to Hopkins and are full of themselves tend to think they've got everything right. And the reality is things change. So it's much, much better to have a healthy skepticism of your own judgment. And that's, that's one of the biggest uh, components of quality in medicine. Uh, like everything else in life, checking your ego at the door. Now, legally, again, uh, Jesus is not a doc that, that will be able to see patients with us. He doesn't do that. But like many public health programs, he's got some uh, administrative activities. He runs the CCM program. He runs the content program for the channel. And he does several other components, supervises some of our um, some of our folks making calls from an administrative perspective. Uh, the clinical work still comes up to me. So great discussion. Thank you for the clarification, Dr. Vega. I have another comment on that, and it's how much do we spend studying? So I, I believe in the U.S. you got a bachelor that can be in whatever then four years of med school, and then the years that you spend on the residency program. For us in Mexico, we study, and, and other countries, I think it's similar. We study five years of med school. That's just base, basic medicine. And we spend at least three years of that going into the hospital as a med student. Then we spend a year uh, on an internship program. And then we spend a year on a social service program, which is basically working for free on a small clinic all over the mountains just to pay back to the government or education. Even, even if we went to a private school, that's the same for everybody. So that's seven years only for general practice. And then you go into your the residency program that can be up from three to seven years. So believe it or not, I, I, I can say that I spent seven years studying what U.S. physicians learn in four years, probably more. Not a surprise to me. Thanks for adding that. Bobby Ocampo, please email your training costs for doctors. I will send it to our major hospital in the Philippines. Oh, yeah. Um, that's a, so basically, uh, hmm. Uh, you know what he's asking, Jesus? He's talking about the training for the Physician Prevention Network. We don't have a we don't have a that kind of uh, participation yet. Uh, we'll figure it out and let you know. Yeah, definitely. Uh, wait until the, uh, it's a good question, Bobby. Wait until we get the the website up and then uh, then respond to us, and then we will get you the information you're asking for. JMK twenty nine twenty one. My recent CRP high sensitivity CRP was 0.7, and my albumin creatinine ratio was one. My cardiologist still went crazy when I would not take high intensity statins for LDL of 128. I'm taking five milligrams of Crestor for its inflammatory effect. Maybe you need to get a new doc. Now that's, I mean, I, I have patients. I'm totally comfortable with what you've shown right there. I've got, uh, gosh, maybe dozens, maybe hundreds of patients with that specific component. Melissa, is Ezekiel bread okay to eat if you want bread to eat bread? I don't think so. I'm, I may be wrong. My memory may be wrong. I remember somebody recommended it to me a while back and they talk about how healthy it is and it's very seed intensive. And because it's seed and, and sprout intensive, it's therefore healthier and lower carb role. You know how to find out? Eat a bunch of Ezekiel bread and get your blood sugar half an hour later. And that'll tell you. When I looked at it, it looked like a lot of carbs to me. Now, there are really good carb, um, carb friendly breads now. There weren't when I went low carb five years ago. But just look on Amazon. Um, 
I've gotten to where I don't eat uh, sandwiches anymore, but I did try some of these about a year ago and made these paninis, you know, these grilled sandwiches with them. Oh, gosh, they were really, really good. But I just got out of the habit of eating sandwiches, which is healthy. Rick at the Gun, one. My wife recently learned that she was APOE34. While early, with early dementia history in her family, she is now scared to eat most anything, especially all fats. What advice would you give for diet? Uh, we grossly overestimate the, the dangers associated with eating fat with uh, APOE4. I've got plenty of patients. You know, I've got patients that have APOE44, so they say, well, I can't eat fat. And they've also got uh, um, uh, kidney disease, so they say, well, I can't eat protein. So what are you going to eat? Carbs? That's even worse. You know, uh, I think Phil Bredesen had a really good, um, or Dale Bredesen, excuse me. Dale Bredesen has some really good uh, components on this in his book. His perspective, and I agree with it, is people underestimate the concern about carbs and overestimate the risk associated with, APO, with fats and APOE34. Once you start actually uh, questioning that, getting to the proper body weight is the most important thing, 10 times more important than these two concerns. So get to the proper body weight, stay a little bit ketotic, as Bredesen says in his book, and... Uh, don't worry so much about um, about the fats that are needed to keep you ketotic. Any comments from your side? And we have we have covered this a couple of weeks back with David Mines, and you have talked about this. And there are a couple of videos on the channel talking about type three diabetes and how insulin resistance is a phenomenon that also happens in the brain and how diabetes or it's 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 the main cause for alzheimer's it's basically rooted on the physiopathologic pathways that leads to dementia so i will say carbs are really the worst case scenario to get uh, to develop dementia rick at the gun one dr brewer what do you eat for breakfast every day i struggle with this i'll give you three options these are my most common three breakfasts Remember, I covered it today in the first content item. Remember those microwavable uh, chicharrones, pork rinds. It's the fat, the subcutaneous fat of a pork stripped off, and it's like a potato chip. But when you microwave these, they come at the, the non-exploded, non-big uh, form. And when you microwave it, it's like popcorn. It's really, really good. I have that with coffee. That's item number one. Breakfast number two is just a little slip of uh, smoked salmon. Breakfast number three is nothing. I skip breakfast. So those are my versions. What do you have for breakfast, Dr. Vega? Um, I'm usually not eating breakfast like just two or three days a week. And I usually get some salad and eggs. That's what I eat. Salad and eggs. Very good. Or no breakfast. So, or no breakfast, yeah. Um, you know, when they talk about time-restricted eating, they talk about the best meal to skip is dinner. I've met three patients that do that, it, you know, and, and you can do that better if you're retired and you and your wife or you and your spouse both skip dinner. But the rest of us mere mortals, it's easier to skip breakfast. Just, you know, dinner is so much of a part of social life all across the world. So, Kafi Adego, writing from Ghana, we want to set up a training program for doctors regarding prevention and diagnosing insulin resistance. <clears throat> we will call your office to discuss. That's very exciting to hear. Thank you so much. My daughter spent a month in Ghana a few years ago. <clears throat> she came back very impressed. Why don't you take the next one, Jesus? Yep. This is Melissa. Getting a CIMT on December 1st. Thanks to your website, I was able to find a place that offers them. Thanks. Mm -hmm. Yes, and we have had that question a lot. Of where can I get a CIMT? And you can call to 859-721-1414. We work with a company called Cardio Risk that we <clears throat> know they send reliable CIMT results. And they are in some places in the U.S. And you can just contact them and get scheduled just like Melissa did. This is an interesting comment. 
Jesus, do you know James Cantor? I I have seen him on the broadcast before. I know he's a physician as well, but I'm not familiar with the whole history behind him. He's a physician as well? I think so, right? I didn't know that. I did know that he mentioned several times he has diabetes. Look at this. Diabetes with a calcium score of zero and a very clear CIMT. Um, very, very impressive. And, and it's logical uh, on his side. He, he, he said he has, he has a CIC score of zero. And he said, well, let's get a CIMT. It's under ten yeah. percent, so that's something that we can be comfortable. He can be comfortable to say that there's no soft play. And let us know, James, if you're a doc. I didn't know that piece. I think so. I don't know. I probably just didn't see that correctly. D Dutton, are the nitrates in beetroot organic, organic or inorganic? I don't know. I think they're organic, but I have no idea. How about you? No, no idea. I will say so too, but not not sure. So, James, other than keeping my sugar low, what should I do or test for? Obviously, body fat is the critical uh, thing. You can't, you know, age is the major driver. Uh, you know, the alternatives for changing your age are not, not that, you know, you know, there's not much there. But body fat is a big, big issue. And exercise and sleep, things that impact uh, cortisol and epinephrine release. Um <clears throat> Those are some of the critical pieces. Um, and we've got, if you'd like to take a look, we've got several series of videos on cardiovascular inflammation. I would take a look at that. And we've, as we've discussed today, fractionation is a good, good thing to be aware of as well. People often get their first uh, signs of metabolic problems in their fractionation. Let me see what we're, oh, okay, we're, we may be able to make it here. Melissa, would stent placement or ca uh, cabbage bypass help you feel better if you have 60% or greater plaque in your coronary arteries by having better blood flow? Uh, I've had multiple patients tell me, uh, Dr. B, you, uh, you're wrong. I, I had a stent or I had a bypass and it decreased my pain. No argument with that. I'm sure that has helped quite a bit. However, if you actually take a look at the clinical trials where they did sham procedures, I think it was, was it the Cur or Orbita trial? Uh, not only did it not prevent heart attacks, it didn't change the level of um, angina that they had. So that's where I'll leave it. Uh, I'd be very nervous about getting, I'm very, I, I would get, I would think long and hard before I got a stent. Harvey Ops, looks like there is a lot of turbulence after the occlusion. Maybe the turbulence damages the endothelium and precipitates a clot. Well, there may be some mechanical components. When we see things like the, the bifurcation of the carotid, that's where we usually first see uh, plaque form. So yes, there is some mechanical stuff going on there. But still, this is a metabolic issue. You, you don't see it in people that have their carb uh, metabolism under control and they do not have other sources of inflammation. So um, I, I, will add, I will add to that. Um, we talked about the glycocalyx calyx in the past. Right. And the endothelium, a healthy endothelium is made to resist that kind of turbulence. It, it's made to, to get the blood flow there. That, that's why it, it's there. But when you have an endothelium that is inflamed, that those characteristics get, get affected. So of course they will be less able to resist that turbulence and get some mechanical issues there. But the mechanical, the blood flow is not the problem. The problem is the infl inflammation beneath the damage, the, the endothelium. Very, very good point. And speaking of good points, JMK has a wonderful point here. Attention, Melissa, make sure that your upcoming CIMT will identify soft plaque. I recently underwent a CIMT, in quotes, and all my tests said was you have plaque with no mention of soft versus hard plaque. That is another point. And again, I, I had two this week. Both of them were totally inadequate. 
Both of them did the same thing. They talked about having plaque. One of them measured it. The other one didn't. And neither one of them said whether there was any soft plaque. That does us no good. Little to no good. I mean, if somebody didn't know they had any cardiovascular disease and they come in, the CIMT shows that they have plaque. Yes, that shows something that's very important. Uh, at that point, you should consider a low dose statin and baby aspirin. But what you really want to know next is, is that plaque soft? Harvey Ops, Doc, your Toyota engineering experience shows up in your analysis. I've been to the Georgetown plant. Maybe we should have Toyota run the AMA. That's a really good point. So <clears throat> here's an interesting thing. So they, uh, we also, I had a lot of fun at Toyota. Uh, we had a thing called uh, the supplier uh, support group. And basically senior management would go out to suppliers and um, help them develop lean manufacturing. They made an assumption that I didn't want to do that. And I thought, oh, you're crazy. I'd love to do that. And in fact, I, um, I had a blast and did a lot of good work in terms of uh, a Fujitsu 10 radio uh, 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 production cell for our, our uh, um, other people call it assembly line. I was the space guy, the space cowboy. We actually, we started off with... Um, a program that had about nine people. It had started with 36 people. There had been other uh, programs there. They'd gotten it down to nine. The guy said, you're never going to get it less than nine. We got it to two and a half and it was 40 feet. We got it to 15 feet. Now people will say, well, yeah, but you laid off people. No, we didn't. There's a guarantee in terms of doing that, that you don't lay off people. And it's not, it's not just being, um, it's not just being uh, good or ethical to people. There's also a very hardcore business reason for doing that. Most of the Kaizen's come from the people themselves. If you, if the people themselves have any clue that they're going to lose their job as a result of their Kaizen's, they're not going to come up with any. It's just um, common sense, which is not very common. So the other thing that happened um, regarding me and engineering at Toyota, they said um, <clears throat> a couple of other experiences. One was when I got there, uh, you know, I had Ford on my name tag and I, I was the medical director. So I'd go out to check on injuries <laughs> and stuff. And there were several times when people said, oh, I'm sorry, you can't come in here. Uh, we don't have other other car manufacturers in here. And I had to, I'm not another... My name is Ford. I'm not, I don't work for Ford. Regarding the comment about engineering. So they had coaching programs for all the senior management. Again, they said, well, we're assuming you don't have time. And I said, no, no, I'd love to have that. I enjoyed working with the coach. And one of the things she started saying to me was, you know, you're very, you're weird. You're unusual. <clears throat> you're not... Uh, a doctor who's doing some engineering here. You're an engineer that's doing medicine. You think like Toyota engineers. So I really appreciated that. That was a compliment and I'll still see it as a compliment. And it's very true. When I was at Toyota in, in, in Toyota, the concepts, the thinking was just so much more obvious and intuitive to me than when I was in the hospitals. So <clears throat> the marriage uh, needs to happen. There's a lot of it going on. A lot of people have seen me for consultation for uh, lean process control in medicine. We had people from hospitals and other groups coming down to visit us at the program we built in primary care at the San Antonio plant. Uh, <clears throat> lean, pro and lean and process control are big deals in medicine, especially hospitals now. D. Dutton, Ricky the, Ricky the Gun 1, Dementia, please read Dr. Dale Bredesen's second and third book. Can Crestor pot potentially reduce inflammation in the brain? Does it really pass to the blood brain through the blood brain barrier? I see you nodding. You want to vocalize that? Not sure, Doc. Uh, that's, that's one that I, I don't think, I don't think it, it, it needs to go through the barrier. But I don't know what you think. 
Yeah. So <clears throat> we're, I don't, there's a lot of focus on uh, water soluble versus uh, fat soluble statins. Uh, you can make a comment about that if you want. Um, I tend to be less concerned about that. I tend to be less concerned about uh, a statin having an impact on inflammation in the brain. I'm concerned about inflammation in the bloodstream. And I think that's why you're nodding your head. So let's not worry about the specific brain, eye, kidney, heart, tissue. Let's worry about the vessels that supply those. And yes, they do help for that. Desitivity, please ignore political and economic comments. Bart Robinson, thank you very much for answering the question. Scheduled my OGTT and insulin survey. Where is best info on interpreting the results? Here's the problem. Don't you interpret the, the, the results based on the standards you're given because the labs give you standard interpretations. And I've had, I, I just had this happen over and over again. I really appreciate you bringing this up, Gil, because I, I have some patients that <clears throat> had not full-blown diabetes, but clearly enough prediabetes to cause plaque, inflammation, and this problem. And they interpreted their own results based on what they got from uh, the lab. And it was wrong. Think about how the labs do their standards. Two standard deviations. Well, think about this the information is already very clear. It's not two thirds of people age 60 or over, it's one half of people age 30 and over have prediabetes. Once you begin to realize those statistics, now go back and look at the, the, the lab quote standards and how they're developed. They're looking at people where the, the majority of the population already has a significant problem here and they're assuming that they don't. They're assuming standard deviations and means. The mean has the problem. Uh, I don't know how to describe that to a non-statistician. Any translation for me, Jesus? Mm, not, not really. Okay. I, I can come up with anything for that. Okay. So again, the bottom line is don't use the lab standards for interpreting those tests. Come see us, 859-721-1414. Thank you, Aspen. I appreciate you keeping up and listening like that. Harvey Ops, base culture keto bread, four carbs per slice. Yes, I mean, there's some of these keto breads at three and four carbs per slice. In a, even in a uh, keto diet, you can, you can tolerate a little bit of that. E.L. Roche, great content today. E.L. is... Uh, is somebody I know. He's done some great work in this prevention area. Uh, thank you again for your comment, E.L. Uh, Ali Safian, doctor, I went to lose weight with metformin. I weighed 105 kilograms, five feet nine, 30, uh, 31 years old. Metformin doesn't always work, but it helps a lot of people. Uh, I've got a lot of people that have taken it and have uh, lost weight with it. There are new drugs that help even more so. They're very expensive, though. They're called glip ones, like Ozempic. And, <clears throat> and I, I was, I, I, because of what's happened with the Ozempic and glip one revolution, I find myself saying this over and over and over again. I'm not necessarily a diet doc. That's not my thing. That's not what we do. We're cardiovascular. But Ozempic and the other glip ones have just blasted away the cardiovascular outcome trials, CVOTs, cardiovascular outcome trials. What those uh, do is they show that uh, the FDA has finally caught on to the fact that we're less concerned about long-term diabetes impact for a diabetes drug. We're more concerned about cardiovascular outcomes for a diabetes drug. These GLP-1s are originally diabetes drugs. And they are knocking it out of the park. They are in short. What does that mean? They're saving lives from diabetes. Well, what's the most common thing? The biggest thing that uh, would help in terms of diabetes, losing body fat. So it's not a big surprise, but losing body fat is not the only 
uh, way they they had their impact. They have other have other mechanisms. I, I have a, a comment on that. Uh, metformin is basically one of the cheapest and safest yes. medications for that. And losing weight is one of the benefits, but it has other benefits related to glucose metabolism. And I think we talked about a news that happened last week or a couple of weeks back on the U.S. And I just saw one in Mexico as well about a sh sh shortage of Ozempic on yes. both the U.S. And, and Mexico because people are, are getting those to lose weight. And I will say, if you're having issues losing weight or you have some uh, kilograms or pounds over the ones that you might need, you might probably have prediabetes and insulin resistance as well. So... Uh, here, at least in Mexico, the point of view was, well, what is up with all these, all these people that are taking important anti-diabetic medication for people who really need them? And I was like, maybe they need it too. <laughs> but they need that and do other stuff. That, that, that's what they probably they're not doing because it's, it's not just the medication. That's, that's, that's not going to solve the problem by itself. You know, you, there are two points that you make that I think are really key. One is that concept of, oh, you're keeping it away from diabetics that really need it. Uh, are we sure that those people that are overweight are not diabetic? Because if they look through our lenses, if they did what we do for a living all day, every day, they wouldn't be nearly so concerned about that. Because a lot more, it's like uh, body weight, body fat, diabetes, prediabetes, and just over and over and over again. It's like you start to get like Pavlov's dogs, you know, they ring the bell, they think of food. Uh, we see body fat, we think of diabetes and prediabetes. There was another comment that you made that was perhaps even more critical, and that is the number of patients that have come to us and they're on those drugs and maybe more, like at those and SGLT2s, and they're still maintaining their body weight. Uh, if you don't change your lifestyle, lifestyle is king. If you don't change your lifestyle, no amount of drugs is going to make a difference. Edmund Bant spent a year in Ghana, 68, 69. Good for you. Texas hate, hates Park, Heights Park. If you considered ablation anymore for your AFib. Uh, yeah, I consider it regularly in terms of when people bring it up and ask me about it, and I'm very glad I didn't get an ablation. I just, you know, I lost a few pounds. I've continued to do stuff to improve my own health. And I just rarely get into the, um, uh, I'm doing better than most people that have had an ablation. If I had had one, it would have been three or four years ago. I would be back. You know, these, those ablations tend to last 18 months. So let me go back and provide some information. Um, I know that I have atrial fib. The vast majority of people that have paroxysmal atrial fib, like I do, don't know it because it happens for a few seconds and then it's gone. It's where you get a real fast heartbeat. Um, and it's very much associated with diabetes. It is by far the most common uh, dysrhythmia or arrhythmia of the heart. And it increases your probability of having a stroke by a factor of five to eight times. So it's very important. Now, a lot of people get that and they say, oh, I'm going to have an ablation. An ablation is where they go in through the groin with a needle like they're going to go do a stent. But instead of doing a stent, they freeze some areas around a, an area of the heart, the atria, that tends to form these ablation type of this, uh, the, this, this fibrillation. The docs that do that believe in it 100%. And they think everybody needs one. And I'm sure if you've got one and you've seen a doc, he or she's recommended it. Just like if you're a hammer, everything looks like a nail. Now, most of these uh, ablations don't work very long. 18 months, 36 months, and they're back again. So I elected not to have mine. I did a couple of other things. What did I do? Lifestyle just like everything else, just like heart failure, just like cardiovascular uh, disease prevention, just like uh, diabetes health. I did lifestyle. Now, what are the big lifestyle things for atrial fib? Number one, uh, sleep apnea. I did a lot of things to improve my sleep apnea, including sleeping on my side. 
um, and including some Invisalign, which actually uh, increased the size of my uh, jaw space and decreased uh, this thing of pushing the back of my tongue back into my airway. So I did those two things. I lost about eight pounds from where I was at that point in time. My blood pressure went down about 10 points. I've not had uh, witness fibrillation in three years. I mean, maybe two or three different episodes. But I was, at that point in time, three or four years ago, 20% and over 20% in some on some days in fibrillation. You don't want to be in that space. So one other thing I'll say about that is this. If you're in that kind of shape, if you're having that much fibrillation, you don't want it to go on for a long time because it's like wearing ruts into the road. Um, you run a risk of that becoming permanent. So focus on the lifestyle. Don't automatically jump to ablation. Um, don't drink alcohol every day. Alcohol is a, a problem in that space as well. But if you can't uh, get it improved with decreased sleep, nap, sleep apnea, decreased blood pressure, decreased body weight, uh, exercise, then, yeah, at that point, I would consider ablation. Any other comments about that? Um, I think that there may, might be a small group that might benefit from that, but it's just like with, with the discussion with the stents. It's, it's not like the first option for everyone. And the first step is to detect it. And if you are not uh, not sure that the lifestyle changes that you have done or you are doing are the things that you need to do, probably they're not. So you have to come forward and, and take a look with, with probably Dr. Brewer to see if the stuff that you're doing is the, the things that you need. Thank you much. Harvey says, you didn't lay people off. That's true. This is the Toyota that, the Toyota secret that the U.S. doesn't copy. Very true. And there's uh, there's really good reason, and I stated it. Kaizen comes from, from frontline workers, and they won't put it out there if they know they're going to lose, if, they, if it causes them to lose a job. Melissa, I also fo follow Dr. Grieger. I'm confused about carbs now. Also about meat and eggs increasing TMAO. So I did a, a, a video on TMAO. TMAO actually, uh, there's components of the TMAO, trimethylamine oxide, uh, that are true. Uh, the me metabolism is correct. But at the end of the day, once you actually look deeper into it, it appears that it's really mostly a risk for people with kidney function problems, not the vast majority of us. And I hate to talk bad about people, but I will say this: Dr. Grieger is uh, receives his re receives his salary and compensation by groups that are anti um, uh, um, animal protection leagues, so they don't believe in eating meat. I am guessing that he's totally comfortable with that because he believes ethically in not eating meat as well. But please be aware of that. Um, from my perspective, uh, I don't have a problem with, I, I don't have ethics issues regarding what kind of foods we eat and where our, um, where our macronutrients come from. Eggman Bett, Dr. Brewer having chronic and persistent fibrillation for 15 months and a cardioversion failing after three days, is ablation gonna be any better? So I'm not sure what else to say about ablation. Maybe, Jesus, you're picking up something on the question that I didn't get. But bottom line is, no, ablation is not a great solution. Hopefully, if you can do the lifestyle stuff and be successful like I have, you're better off. Yeah, and, and if he had already a cardioversion, I, will, I would like to know what was the context behind that. I can tell you, I'm an American Heart Association instructor for advanced cardiovascular life support. And we do know that when somebody has a, a tachycardia that is combined with symptoms that are low, uh, low uh, volume, like they're basically in shock, you might need to do a cardioversion that is basically shocking the chest to get that heart in a regular rhythm. Uh, if you had that, like, 
um, scheduled, that's something that they usually can do, but that doesn't mean that it's going to solve everything as well. So I would, I would like to hear a little bit about the context, if that atrial fibrillation is pro, uh, producing symptoms as well. Or so there, there's, there's a bunch of questions behind that. But if, yeah. if there's no lifestyle component behind it, uh, I don't think doing ablation and all of that, it's going to really solve the problem. So Edmund, you've got three other questions down there. We're starting to get into trying to take care of your specific case as a patient. And we don't do patient work on the, uh, you know, in the, in the public like this. We do answer questions. So if you do want to get into a patient perspective, thank you, Aspen. Give us a call at 859-721-1414, and we can go a little bit deeper into your specific case. Ayun Ardeen, I asked my doctor for a CIMT and they did a carotid ultrasound. That happens all the time. Are these the same? No, the CIMT is the use of a special software which looks at the actual level of plaque within the carotid artery and it tells you whether or not it's soft or stable. Bart, another excellent stream. Thank you, gentlemen. Thank you so much, Bart. Uh, okay, doesn't ticosine help with AFib? Uh, do you know what that is? I'm not familiar with that. Edmund says I need to push my doc for no more tests. I'm not sure that you do. Um, knowing what to ask for and pay privately for are not yet obvious. Again, you can give us a call. Hopefully we can help you a little bit. Very good. So thank you so much, Dr. Vega. Anything? Any other comments before we sign off? No. Nope. Thank you for inviting me to this broadcast. Uh, it was really interesting, and thank you for the, to the folks for their questions. This, I, I just want to point out something that I noticed a few weeks back and haven't said. The audience that follows the live stream, I can tell just right at the beginning, most of them know a lot more than most docs know about this. So thank you for your comments. It's yeah. really, really interesting. It is very interesting, and you uh, you underemphasize the the word, but that was a critical word. These people know more than most doctors do about this space. Not most people, most doctors. So, I would agree. Our patients know so much more about this than the typical doctor. Thank you so much. Have a good day.